gender issues touch all areas of our social life and institutions. To develop productive citizens, we must appreciate the differences between men and women. Differences that are based on physiological and biological realities, as well as social ones. The Speaker of the House, the Honorable Wade Mark, made this statement during his feature address to the fifth form students of Asha Girls College, Saraswati Girls Hindu College, and Holy Faith Convent, Kuva. It was all part of the Parliament's school outreach initiative, which is aimed at building public awareness of the role and importance of Parliament in sustaining democracy and promoting good governance. At the lecture, which took place on Thursday, November 7, 2013, at the Rujanath Kapaldeo Learning Resource Center in Kuva, the topic centered on gender affairs and Parliament. At the onset, the students learned about Parliament's role in ensuring that all citizens are treated fairly in society. As the institutions responsible for upholding and safeguarding the rights of its citizens, as well as setting the direction of a country's policies, Parliament's the world over are therefore well poised to champion gender issues and concerns over gender equality. It therefore becomes very important that as a legislature, we, the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, seek to eliminate all gender-based discrimination and ensure equality and human dignity for all our citizens, men, women, girls, and boys. Women have often spearheaded discussions on ways to eliminate gender-based discrimination and violence. They have also brought issues such as parental leave and child care to the forefront in Parliament. Men too have lobbied for women's issues to be placed on the legislative agenda and these have been dealt with accordingly. Still, there is need for more female representation in parliaments which generally are not gender sensitive institutions. This brings me home to the specific case of the Parliament of our Republic and the role it has played and continues to play in treating with issues of gender. In Trinidad and Tobago, political power and political life have traditionally been dominated by men. And although Miss Audrey Lane Jeffers holds the distinction of being the first woman to be elected to the Legislative Council in 1948 in the first ever general election held in 1956. There were no female candidates. However, in 1986, five women were elected to the then 36 member House of Representatives, with four being appointed to the 31 member Senate. Currently, there are 12 female parliamentarians in the House of Representatives out of a total of 41 members of Parliament. The increase in women parliamentarians has enabled the creation of laws to protect women and support gender issues. 
some of these laws, which are manifested in the form of acts, include the Maternity Protection Act, the Cohabitational Relationships Act, and the Domestic Violence Act. In 2012, the paid maternity leave entitlement was increased from 13 weeks to 14 weeks. The Cohabitational Relationships Act was created to safeguard the rights of common-law spouses, allowing them to claim support for a child that may have resulted from that union. Common-law spouses can also apply for an adjustment of property. These provisions, however, would only be considered if the union lasted for more than five years. Additionally, the Domestic Violence Act, which was updated in 1999, the court can also provide financial assistance for the child of a domestic violence victim. The speaker reminded the students that gender affairs not only addresses women's issues, but also the concerns of men in society. Thus, men and women must work together to promote gender equality within political parties and within the institution of parliament. A true partnership is the key to the real and long-lasting change. The speaker then encouraged students to identify ways in which they too can make a difference in gender affairs. An interactive question and answer segment followed the speaker's presentation, where students were allowed to ask questions of members of the head table. For this lecture, the speaker was joined by the Honorable Ramona Ramdial, Member of Parliament for Coover North, Mrs. Diana Mahabia Wyatt, former independent senator and resource person, and Mrs. Jacqueline Phillips Stout, procedural clerk. A student from Asja Girls College led off the segment. As we know, um, there are laws um, being implemented for the rights of women, but we still see cases of women being abused and women treated unfairly. So um, my question is, how are these laws being enforced for um, the rights of women because they are seeing that they are these laws and yet still we are seeing women being treated unfairly. That's a very interesting question that you have asked. The reality is that in all societies and in Trinidad and Tobago in particular, we do have laws that are designed to protect and safeguard the rights of women against abuse. But in our society, we still witness instances of abuse, total disregard for women by men. And certainly, there are avenues available under the law to redress those wrongs. I don't believe that we can ever eliminate it, but what we can do, of course, is to significantly reduce it. It would be very, very good to live in a world where men and women would respect each other, and particularly men respecting women and upholding their dignity and their rights. But whenever there are infractions, there are laws available in the land and procedures to follow in order to safeguard the rights of women in that regard. I believe as well that education and through that process, an appreciation of the rights and the equality of the gender, both men and women in this regard, ought to be continued at the level of our educational um, system. That is from the kindergarten, to the primary school, to the secondary school, to the tertiary institution. Education and appreciation through that process would go a long way in recognizing and appreciating 
and respecting the rights of women in our nation. But there are avenues available to women whenever they are abused to go to the courts in order to seek redress. Um, Senator, former Senator Dana Mahabia Wyatt has played a very important role in this area of domestic violence, particularly against women. I also know, I do not know how widespread it is, maybe Dana could tell us, but I also know that men, some men are also subject to domestic violence in this country. I do not know how widespread it is. What I do know is that women are subjected more to abuse and violence by men. And as I said, there are areas available and channels available for redress. But I will ask Senator, former Senator Dana Marbia Wyatt to also elaborate on this very important matter that you have raised. Um, thanks for handing it over to me because I am going to say things which are going to be very different uh, from what Mr. Mark just said. Yes, we do have legislation, and I'm glad we have legislation. I was one, I was in the Senate, and I was very much a part of the um, cohabitation bill, which we really put through because in so many cases, people get married. Uh, at a young age, they split up, and then one or other of them goes to live with somebody else and can be living with them for the next 30 years when the spouse dies and the original spouse comes and claims all the property because they have been left without a will. So you can be married to somebody for 30 years, have five children with them, or be living with them, and uh, when your husband dies, his former wife, who has not even been seen for the last 30 years, comes and kicks you out of the house and claims. That was really the impetus behind getting that bill through. That can't happen anymore. If you can prove that you've been living together as man and wife for a period of five years, then um, you will inherit uh, in accordance with the laws of um, inheritance. Also, I want to comment about the Domestic Violence Act because you're absolutely right. Uh, women still are abused, but uh, Mr. Mark is also right in that that's not going to stop. As far as I can figure out, it's been happening ever since civilization has existed, and probably before that. But the legislation we have, the Domestic Violence Act, and I was part of both domestic violence acts as they were passed, isn't working anymore. Why is it not working? Because although you can get a protection order, um, our society has become more and more violent. And people ignore protection orders. Yes, you get a protection order that says, no, you cannot come within 50 feet of this person or their house or 100 feet. It doesn't matter. Um, they will find other ways. They will break the protection order to get police to come and do something to punish the offender or to protect the woman and children, don't forget we're talking about women and children, um, is very difficult. There is one part of the police service which has recently been set up and it's called the Victim Support Unit, which is headed by a wonderful woman called Margaret Sampson Brown that is very effective. If you can get one of those people from the um, Victim Support Unit, they will help. But you can't put a police officer in everybody's house because domestic violence, by and large, takes place in the house. And I could go on for about six hours, but I won't, as to how it takes place, why it takes place, and what you can do about it. But we need to recognize that our environment is changing, and it is becoming more and more violent culturally sociologically and physically. And one of the things which we have to do as women, and I'm counting every single one of you here, is we don't sit back and wait for government to pass laws to protect us. We organize ourselves and each other, and we help each other. You must always remember that if any other woman asks you for help, you always respond. So that when you are in trouble, 
that they will respond. And as it becomes more and more common, we all at some point or another needed the help and support of other women. And so we start organizations. We started, for example, the one I run, which Mr. Mark has just referred to, is a Coalition Against Domestic Violence slash Rape Crisis Center. And we have counseling in different parts of the country. And incidentally, those of you who are on Facebook and YouTube, we just yesterday put up 10 videos, 10 short videos. They're only three to four minutes each about about good parenting and how to avoid child abuse and how to bring up children without beating, without abusing. I recommend that all of you, as soon as you go home, get on to um, your computers, go on to YouTube, and you'll find it. It's under CADV Rape Crisis, and it's called Love and Family. But we do things like that. We also lobby for changes in legislation. We try to, and we have very recently got um, lawyers in every magistrate's court in Trinidad and Tobago who have promised to work for women pro bono. One of the things that has been set up by the government is a legal aid authority, which is supposed to do the same thing, but very often because of bureaucratic problems, you don't get help through that. We have to be strong enough and brave enough and honest enough to organize and help each other. One of the things which Mr. Mark just mentioned is that there are men who are also victims of domestic violence, and there are. We are not angels, okay? Women are not angels, and I never um, try to act as though we are. I can see some of you smiling. You know perfectly well you're not angels. And we can, we can be just as vicious with our tongues and with our criticism as men can be with their fists. And in terms of child abuse, the majority of child abuse is by women. We have to learn to be better parents or better school teachers because teacher, anybody who is in local parentis, which means acting in the, in the, with the authority of a parent, um, has the power to discipline. But discipline does not mean punishment. Discipline, discipline means learn. We have to learn to be dis decent to each other. And we have to learn that gender affairs, as Mr. Mark has just said, gender affairs involves both of us. Um, gang warfare is gender affairs. Men, male against male violence is gender affairs, and it concerns us because there are our sons, our partners, our brothers are killing each other. And pretty soon, if it keeps up like this, none of you girls is going to have anyone to marry because there are not going to be any um, decent young males around. So you have to be concerned with vi male violence against males as well. i got to stop now because I'll go on forever <coughs> otherwise. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to, of course, support all that Mrs. Wyatt and the speaker said. But I also want to say that I spent a year working at the Ministry of Gender, uh, Youth, Gender, and Child Development. And what I noticed with the different units, especially Gender Affairs and the Children's Authority, with respect to its operations, was that people are generally afraid to speak. Those who are abused either by their husbands, women abused by their husbands, children abused by parents, they are afraid to speak and come out and say exactly what is happening. And because of the lack of reporting, you have that, that gap where it is that the protective services are unable to do anything to protect women and children and even our males uh, with respect to abuse and its different forms of abuse. So therefore, I just want to urge you young women here uh, this morning to not be afraid to speak out and even to help a friend or a family member. Um, I also want to identify that poverty has a lot to do with abuse, especially uh, with regards to our women and children. Sometimes a mother is afraid to come out and report because of the financial situation that she's in and she's dependent on a man to produce and to earn for her children and herself. And again, that comes from the fear of, um, or having a fear of reporting what is going on. Um, Mrs. Ramona Ramdiel was talking about um, the report rates are very low. 
So, my question is, how can women go about taking legal action against an employer or a spouse if treated unfairly? A pleasant good morning to everyone. My question is posed to the entire head table. And it is, if the mindset of society is such that women are thought to be inferior by men particularly, then I suppose the mindset of society needs to change. How does the parliament intend to change this way of thinking, as most opinions are culturally influenced from childhood? Thank you. Hey, good morning. My name is Linda Maharaj. I'm from Saraswati Girls Hindu College. This is directed to the Honorable Widma. As the Speaker of the House, do you think that gender biases exist in the House of Representatives? I'll start uh, by addressing the second question the young lady asked. Um, how can a woman go about taking action against employer or spouse with respect to abuse? And as I said earlier, um, at the Ministry of Gender, Youth and Child Development, we have different authorities. For example, we have the Children's Authority, who deals with uh, reports of abuse and other matters dealing with the child. And therefore, there's a hotline. I don't have the correct number right now. Uh, there's a hotline that can be called, and of course, these issues would be addressed. You'd have an officer come and visit, and the process will take place in addition to having someone from the police service accompany. So the Children's Authority, uh, let, me, let me just say, was set up uh, last year, finally, and we're still in the process of recruiting and getting the capacity that they need to do what they have to do. Uh, with respect to the sexual harassment against women, there's the uh, Offenses Against the Persons Act, that can be accessed, and of course you can have lawyers and the protective services take action and advise. But again, it comes down to the simple idea of what I said earlier with respect to reporting these instances of abuse. So that is why we still have it uh, ever, ever present in society today, because of the non-reporting from our women and even our children. Can I just add to that? That's what trade unions are for. And if, you, if an employer treats a worker unfairly, you go to a trade union, even if you're not, if you don't have a recognized trade union, you can, under law, go to a trade union, join, ask the union to take it up, and within a certain period of time, the union can take it up because it's a matter of your right as an employee and as a human being. Let me add to what Diana said about the trade union element or aspect. I do not know if you are aware that less than 25% of the workforce or the labor force in Trinidad and Tobago is unionized. The workforce is just over 620,000 citizens who work or who are supposed to be working. Of course, there's an unemployment rate of about 5 or 6%. So give and take, let's say we have a working population of about 550,000 in this country. And less than 25% of that 550,000 are represented by trade unions. So you're talking about hundreds of thousands of citizens do not have the protection of the trade union. And where there exists what is called minimum wages orders for what is called sales clerk or sales assistants or people who work in the um, petrol stations, as the case may be, domestic work workers. Even where you have those minimum wages orders indicating how much a worker must get at a minimum per hour, twelve fifty, I think, per hour right now, some employers still do not observe that. I must say that some employers pay their workers more than twelve fifty in some instances. So they have a, a, a unit within the Ministry of Labor called the Labor Inspectorate Division, and they have labor inspectors. So the question that the young lady raised about how do you protect women workers who happen to be abused by employers 
or taken advantage of, then you have that particular facility. But the main question I always pose is that citizens who work in this country, whether in the public sector or the private sector, should be sufficiently conscious to know that they ought to belong to a trade union to protect their interests. And that is very important. Um, the other point that was read about, uh, raised rather about my observations from the position I occupy as to biases towards women, I cannot speak too much about it because where I sit, I have observed some elements which we are seeking to encourage changes towards, meaning would you believe, Diana, and I think Ramona is aware of it, that members of parliament who are women and who sit on the opposition benches under their terms and conditions of employment, I do not see the Salaries Review Commission providing in law provision for pregnancies. No, but they're not employed. They are not employed, but I'm saying as a right, mm -hmm. they ought to be entitled. Just as how we have recently agreed, when I say we, upon the insistence of the parliament, the government has agreed to provide members of parliament, all members of parliament, particularly those on the opposition benches, benches with some level of medical coverage. Before that decision was taken just a few months ago, as a member of parliament on the opposition bench, and if you're a backbencher on the government side, you would not be entitled when you become sick to any medical coverage. When compared to a minister a parliamentary secretary, a minister in the ministry of a particular uh, ministry, as I said, they would be covered under the Salaries Review Commission terms and conditions for members who fall under their purview. It was just about a few months ago, maybe two months ago, that the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago took a decision to effect a measure where Every member of parliament can now have access to medical coverage up to $200,000 per annum. And that, to my mind, is a big advance, whether we talk about the women in this instance, because when they get sick, they need attention, just as when men get sick. So I believe that is a big advance for the parliamentarian the mindset. I don't, I believe that as parliamentarians, we are becoming more and more conscious of the need to bring about gender equality in our society. And it is the role of every member of parliament to really fight for modern legislation to deal with this issue of gender equality in our society. One of the main functions, as you have just seen earlier on, I should say, on facts of the parliament, one of the functions of the parliament is lawmaking. And lawmaking can come from the government or from the opposition or from independent senators. But it is easier to come from the government because they have all the resources. And therefore, it is our responsibility with your support as teenagers and the larger society, wherever there are loopholes and deficiencies and shortcomings in our society as it relates to the gender gap and the mindset that you refer to, to bring these matters to the attention of your elected representatives, whether it is councillors in your districts 
or the elected members in your constituencies so that they can bring forward to the parliament issues for the consideration of the parliament through various devices and tools that they can employ in order to really advance the interests of women and men as it relates to that mindset that you made reference to. That is how I would like to respond to that particular concern. I'd also like to reiterate, and it's one of my personal um, goals to see happen whilst being in government, is that, and I would draw example to the Dominican Republic, why it is that we're all hearing in Trinidad right now issues and topics being discussed, uh, discussed with, uh, with respect to our gender policy. But what the Dominican Republic did was that they skip that um, gender policy and went on straight to have a Bill of Rights for women. And this is actual legislation where women's rights can be enforced through this Bill of Rights. So just as we have globally human rights laws, human rights laws and a Bill of Rights dealing with human rights issues, and you have different articles dealing with the right to free speech, the right to practice religion, etc. The Dominican Republic went further and, of course, instituted a Bill of Rights for women in its country. And I am thinking, as a young woman, that this would be more effective in protecting the rights of women and children if we go along that line of having a Bill of Rights for women and children, as opposed to dealing with the gender policy first and then having it evolve into legislation. And that is just my personal thought. Okay, can I just add to that? Um, at the moment, there are more women being educated on a tertiary level in Trinidad and Tobago than men. I think you probably know that. 80% of the graduates of UE, for example, are now women. And the, we're, the environment is changing, and some of these some of these thoughts that we have are thoughts that we put in our own heads. Because if you feel that you are regarded as being inferior to men, then you are going to act like that. You have to stand up for yourself. You are the ones who are gonna make the changes in society, and it's already happening. When, when we have almost 30% of the House of uh, Representatives female, the respect for women in Parliament is going to happen by itself, by critical mass, when you all start running for Parliament as young women, and that's what we need. Good morning. I'm Sharmila Vandu from Saraswati Girls Hindu College, and I have a question for, for Ms. Ramdial. Um, as we are lucky as students here and the tertiary, as Ms. Wyatt was saying, that we are being educated on the affairs of abuse and those stuff, um, there are some unlucky people who are not. And as Ms. Ramdial was saying, to make a report. Sometimes when this report is carried, they turn the blind air. Like if they are not educated on who to go to, they may go to the police service. And sometimes police turn the blind air, especially to women, or me take it to a different level. I would like to know how you all would want will deal with this situation because it's really affecting the citizens of China and Tobago a lot. We hear about it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, again, as I said earlier, it's an all-round proactive approach that society needs to make, and you are definitely right. For some of us who are, again, afflicted by not being so fortunate to hold a lawyer and to go to a, a, a highly skilled person who would be able within the legal uh, sector to help them. And I understand when you say that the police usually turns a blind eye because I myself, we've personally experienced this with constituents and of course uh, other persons. But what I want to say, there are NGOs, very important NGOs. Uh, Mrs. Wyatt, you said coalition against domestic violence. Crisis center. Rape, the crisis telephone. center. I'll give you the telephone numbers when um, Mr. Ramdial is finished. Yeah, you, you can take over because you have the specific information. Okay, uh, in terms of um, wherever you are, you can call the Rape Crisis Coalition Against Domestic Violence. In, uh, you can call 6240402. And depending on which part of the country you are in, you can have your call directed. Um, there are offices in San Fernando, there are offices in Port of Spain, 
and we are about we, we are intending to set one up in Chaguanas. If you want to call, um, and I really do recommend the victim support unit, that number is 628-4277, and you call extension 12634, or just ask to speak to one of the social workers and there are 24, and they are in every district in Trinidad and Tobago. That is, and I highly recommend them because they're very effective and very efficient. Right. Good morning. My name is Megan Lee Langton Atang from Ashingas College, Charlieville. And my question is to pose that all the members at the head table. What can be done to raise awareness of gender inequality and what methods can be made to change in inequality existing in Trinidad Tobago society. Thank you. I am Amira Mangal from Holy Bay Con Vancouver, and my question is, what is Parliament's response to the new male group that is in its early formative period trying to give a voice to a male parent who hardly ever benefits from court decisions? They claim that decisions seem to favor the mother. How has Parliament considered an input? Thank you. Very good question. Thank you. Can I start with um, how to raise awareness of gender inequality? And I think that every female who exists when she experiences condescension or inequality in her life is aware of it. So I'm assuming that what you mean is that how do we raise awareness amongst our male counterparts? about the fact that what they do is expressing disrespect or gender inequality. And I honestly don't think half the time that they mean some of the things they do. They just, they just do it because it's part of the culture. They've seen their fathers do it. They've seen other people do it. And they think they can get away with it. Don't let them get away with it. If you really experience any aspect of gender inequality, speak up. I agree uh, with Mrs. Wyatt, as I said uh, earlier on, you need to come out and stand up for your rights, so to speak, in the absence of having legislation to enforce it. Um, but you really need to come out and speak. You need to have proper communication channels with persons who you trust who can also safeguard and help you as young women and children in society. Um, let me also say with respect to the awareness that you asked, what are we doing to raise awareness? We have a perfect example here. Parliament today is hosting this gender um, awareness and parliament, gender affairs and parliament, which is very, very important. And this is a forum whereby we can hear you give feedback and move along. And I think they're taking it throughout the country. Am I right? Yes. So uh, let's give the parliament a warm round of applause for this wonderful initiative. Also, as a member of parliament in my constituency, I can speak of, and also uh, with respect to Minister Stacey Rupnarine, as a young woman in parliament through our constituency offices, we have been working with the young and the youths of our particular areas to create awareness in various, with respect to various issues that affect the young people. And of course, gender affairs, gender inequality, these are some of the issues that come up regularly uh, when we visit our constituencies, abuse, reports of abuse, etc. So we are very hands-on with our constituents on the ground, especially our young people who suffer from abuse and our women. So that is also uh, a way of dealing with it. Uh, through the Ministry of Gender, Youth and Child Development, they have embarked upon a series of awareness programs. Uh, you all would have heard of Hazel Brown um, and the Network for Women. And they have been really embarking upon a series of initiatives that would allow for women, girls, and boys to be aware of issues in Trinidad and Tobago and to get feedback and to hold consultations so that we can treat with it. And it comes uh, in the form of ideas, uh, white paper, call it what you may, to government. And it's then go it then goes to cabinet where decisions are made um, with respect to dealing with these issues um, in society, within society. So there are a number of, 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 of uh, agencies, a number of state agencies, a number of private sector agencies, and of course the NGOs who are very, very strong in trying to move together. Let me not also forget our religious institutions. 
they have been doing a lot of work throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I know the Astro Association, the Mahasava, the Roman Catholics Association, they have been really, really working with government and trying to get government to partner with them um, uh, to raise awareness, especially amongst our young people. May I respond to that question? Now, Parliament operates within a particular framework, and our activities are guided by, one, the Constitution of the Republic, two, the standing orders of both houses of Parliament, and three, we refer to the House of Commons in the United Kingdom, sometimes when we have deficiencies in our own experiences here, and there's a Bible that they use in the British Parliament, and it is used in many Commonwealth countries. It is written by a former clerk of the House of Commons, Erskine May, Parliamentary Practice. The recent 24th, I think, edition was published just a couple of months ago, I think. Now, the males that you refer to who are not happy with certain decisions of our courts, if they operate within, obviously, constituencies, and I am sure that they are all constituents in the various constituencies, they can approach their members of parliament, and they can bring to their members of parliament those matters that you have referred to. They are not happy with decisions of the court. They find that, for instance, the rulings are going only in favor of mothers as opposed to fathers. They can bring those matters to the attention of their representatives. And their representatives can, through various devices or methods, can bring to the attention of the parliament with a view to taking action, if it is necessary, to correct those matters that they would have brought to their elected officials' attention. These can come in the form of a petition. You can petition the parliament. And if you petition, the parliament on a particular matter, and you have hundreds or thousands of signatures, those matters, once they're debated in the parliament, can then be referred to the government through the cabinet secretariat for the cabinet's consideration. They can also, as I said, use their elected representatives to raise these matters as questions. They can use motions, private members' motion. Or you can write to the committees. Parliament has several committees that deals with ministries, departments, offices, state enterprises, statutory authorities, and they can write to the chairman or the secretariat correspondences, letters, in an effort to bring to the attention of the parliament issues that they would like to see redressed. So there are channels and avenues available to those persons who feel that they need, to re they need redress in an area that is of national concern. It would be uh, remiss of me not to mention something, especially for, your, for you young students here today. How many of you are aware of the young Pakistani girl Malala? Yes, you know her story. And I just want to leave you with that. She created a voice for young girls like yourself in Pakistan when, of course, the government there and the hardliners uh, took a decision to not have young women educated in schools in Pakistan. And of course, as a young woman, she took a decision. She created a movement with other young women like herself. And now she is, of course, globally recognized by the United Nations for being a young girl who stood up for her rights to education in Pakistan. So go up, look at CNN, go up to the internet, look at her story, and be inspired by that.
Thank you very much. All right. Wonderful. At the end of the question and answer segment, there was a photo opportunity where students were able to take photographs with the speaker while others engaged him in further discussions. Earlier in the program, the students were shown a brief video presentation about the facts of Parliament and learned of the institution's three main functions, legislation, representation and oversight of the activities of the government, particularly as they relate to public expenditure. This visit signaled the end of the second phase in the school outreach series. The third phase begins in 2014.